Mornings with Zeralina, now on Sirius XM Progress. Welcome back to Mornings with Zeralina. It's 8 o'clock on the East Coast. It is Tuesday, August the 1st. And joining us on the phone, Frankie Miranda, the president and CEO of the Hispanic Federation. Good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning, Selena. Thank you so much for having me. So help us understand what's going on. I've been reading a lot about what's going on in New York City right now. Um, There are reportedly dozens of people, human beings, sleeping on the streets outside of one of the processing centers for asylum asylum seekers and migrants in the city. Help us understand what's going on, because there are a lot of headlines like that one happening around the country. Well, this is a very complex problem, and thank you so much for bringing light to this. Um, so basically, uh, the governor of Texas and some other Republican governors have decided that they were going to transport human beings from their states, spending millions of dollars transporting them across straight line, state lines under false pretenses and shipping them without lack of coordination, communication to cities, especially New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, to try to grab the headlines and create um, confusion and havoc in these uh, in these cities that have a very positive and welcoming attitude towards immigrants. So this is all a ploy to try to grab the headlines. And of course, because it's a complex issue, it's creating some challenges for, or for cities like New York that has the right to shelter. And of course, we are seeing this as a way to, you know, create more confusion, mm-hmm. grab headlines um, on, on the backs of um, immigrants, vulnerable people that have credible asylum petitions in progress. Yeah, tell us about the, the types of people. I mean, all, all backgrounds, all genders, children, Um, adults, tell us about the people who are on these buses that Governor Abbott and others are just shipping to other parts of the country. Shipping. And and Selena, to be honest with you, he's behaving like a coyote. Uh, There's no difference. This is a person that is exploiting human beings, transporting them across state lines for the, to create some sort of political benefit and creating and making a point. So these are people, mostly people of color. Uh, Most of the headlines have covered people coming, escaping from Venezuela and doing the very dangerous uh, journey of walking through um, many, many different areas of Central America and finally making it to the border. Um, But there are people from many different countries around the world that are part of these asylum seekers. And they have, again, um, based on U.S. law and international law, we have an asylum system that will provide them with the opportunity to make a petition. And now they are in the United States. And because of the way that we have dismantle our immigration system, defunding many of the immigration courts and the people that actually look into these cases, we're creating a a man-made disaster because we're creating a bottlenecking on the fact that we have people here in the United States and that now they are stuck looking for um, continuing their asylum seeking uh, petition and most importantly, their work permits. It is really, really important for people to understand that they are not cutting the line, they're getting in line, but the system is not moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. And we have a labor shortage in the United States. These are people that do not want to be in shelters. They actually want to work. And we have the opportunity to do something, but we are really slow walking this uh, from many different aspects of government, including the federal government. You mentioned a bottleneck. What has changed in the asylum process or in the immigration system, even if if recently? Because I, I remember at the end of the Trump administration, I mean, Stephen Miller was like really busy at the end there. And I don't know what he was doing, but I feel like it's not coincidental that there is a bottleneck and uh, confusion in the system. Were there changes made and what were they? Well, the, the, the fact is that there has been uh, uh, ref- 
the Congress and the federal government in previous administrations and the current Congress refused to provide the necessary resources to the immigration system. There has been a push for immigration reform to provide, uh, a, a, you know, a relief for the 11 million undocumented people that reside in the United States. But then there is this idea that we can close our borders and that we're going to deny our our right or our obligation as a global citizen. Many other countries around the world are taking much more asylum seekers, but we have systemically taken resources away from a system that can provide uh, relief for these individuals and at the same time create a pipeline of workers that are so badly needed in the United States and that can contribute millions and millions of dollars to local economies and we need those workers but there has been this idea that immigrants are a problem that we don't need them that we can close our borders and that we are denying the fact that uh, many of us stay healthy and safe because uh, undocumented workers were providing all those essential services during the pandemic that many mm. people uh, needed. So we are trying to just like put our heads on the ground and try to think that we, this country, don't need these uh, immigrants to come to be part of our society, be part of our workforce, be part of our economy. So what have happened again to your original question is just like a systematic defunding of the entire system that is creating this type of bottleneck and that people are using it as political football for their benefit. You said something that I think is really profound, and I, I want to unpack it a little bit because I think we actually, we don't talk about it, which is this idea that we we always frame immigration as a problem that needs to be fixed. Like, that is right. how we talk about it. Why yeah. should we stop and, doing that? <laughs> and how can we, we stop? Well, <laughs> well because the, the, the very es essence of this country has been that we have created an amazing United States, an amazing nation with influx of immigrants. And this is like, you know, basic United States uh, history 101. It has been through these waves of immigrants that have been able to build our infrastructure, build our economy, continue to grow, in fact, we know that we keep talking about a fiscal cliff, about social security, that our uh, population keeps aging and there's going to be more need for people to serve the aging population, but at the same time, more people to contribute to social security. We can bring so many of these individuals into out of the shadows, mm -hmm. working, may, many of them that are working uh, and being exploited and have not been able to just really be part of the fabric, fully be part of the fabric of the United States and the economy. And they can actually contribute enormously. And some, in some estimates, some people say that they can actually save Social Security for future generations because it will be an immediate influx of people contributing to the system. So the reality is that we need to uh, face the fact that our population continues to live longer. People are needing more, more people to join the workforce. Most recently, there has been this boom in construction around the country, but there are no hands to actually continue mm -hmm. working on these industries. So it is really um, uh, uh, unfortunate that suddenly we are creating this idea that uh, immigrants are a problem immigrants that want to work in many of the industries that are the toughest and probably some of them wants to just do seasonal work they don't want to stay in the united states but by creating these barriers at the border mm. they cannot come back to their countries of origin they just want to make sure that they come do the jobs that are needed and go back to many of the countries of origin so what we're creating is almost just like i need to just cross the border make sure that i get there and hopefully there's going to be some sort of relief but then we're almost closing the door behind them. So it is a very complex problem that we need to have creative approaches and we need to act now. Mm -hmm. uh, New York City has over 56 asylum seekers that have been shipped there. 
according to the city's own estimate, when they do the triage, when they arrive, many of them between 30 to 35 percent, they have a support system somewhere else in the United States. Friends, families, people that can actually take them in. But Governor Abbott continues to to fund these multi-million dollar operation to get them to New York City. It's very simple, Serlina. If the local, state, and federal government have a coordinated response, we can actually deal with this. And it's not that many people that we're talking about right. that are, again, have a credible asylum petition. Let them go through the process. Let's make sure that Congress act or we preferred Congress to act, but if the with the pen of the of the president we can get an executive order, we don't want to get into courts and get into challenges, but we need to get expedited work permits right now for these population. Is that is that the short term solution that um, is possible via the Biden administration unilaterally? Well, sir, sir Nina, to be honest with you. I would like to have somebody coming in and telling Governor Abbott, you need to stop right. creating these right. man-made crises. You need to stop. You have no right. This is almost like sequestering people, just moving them across state lines under false pretenses. But what we need to do is like, we know that, for example, uh, and we were um, supporting the change, the, cha- the rule that challenged in court, the uh, implemented rule that the Biden administration put forward. We believe that people need to have seek asylum no matter where they come from and no matter what's the point of entry, and this must be preserved. But this is just one thing. We need to just make sure that we preserve the asylum, uh, asylum system, that we fund what this, the immigration courts to be able to get these individuals, they only have 12 months to finish their asylum petition. After that window, they go into the shadows. It is almost impossible for them to adjust. We need to get them the, the resources that they need, get their permit, get expedited work permits, and get them to work. In that way, New York City, what they want is just to make sure that these people have the ability, the mayor have called for the federal government right. for expedited work permits. Congressman Espaillat from New York and many others have signed a letter urging the president and Congress to act immediately on these expedited work permits. That is the immediate solution specifically for this population. But we need to face reality, as you say, Serlina, and come back and say, our immigration system needs to be reformed. We need to start all over again. And we need to make a immigration system that actually works for the local economy. Many people have loud complaints, but quiet apologies, because mm. many Republican that are in uh, against many of these immigration reforms, they actually, in private, they basically said, that is going to dismantle my local economy. So they have to be coming together. But as as for the thousands of people that are facing living on the streets because they are being shipped into different cities without any coordination, we need work permits, expedited work permits right now. You mentioned Republicans in private, and and that leads me to my next question, which is about the bad faith sometimes in in conversations about immigration. And I feel like in some ways it's, it's unfortunate how far away from even the conversation we were having just 10 years ago about immigration reform. I mean, I feel like the rhetoric has become so extreme on the right that, you know, it. I don't know what they're saying in private, but I hear what they're saying in public. And there's so much bad faith. It feels like we can never arrive at consensus. And Selena, it affects not only um, the economies, the local economies and the local governments, the way they work, it creates a narrative of hate. Right. Everybody that is black and brown, that has some sort of accent, or that you somehow uh, disclose that you know your ancestral background is somewhere else, it's immediately a target for suspicion. You are a burden. You are a problem. Go back to your country. Even happened to me. I'm 
I'm from, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I'm an American citizen since I was born as part of, of Puerto Rico being a territory of the United States. And people say, go back home, Frankie, because you don't belong here. Just because I have an accent and I'm ground. So this is also a matter of like coming as a country together, recognizing that our immigrant communities are essential to our economies, to our societies, that we are essential to the entire fabric of the United States and stop creating this idea of the other and the enemy and this invasion that sometimes some of the uh, radical right uh, media has been labeling this as some sort of invasion. And when you compare it to other countries, we are not even taking the, the vast majority of asylum seekers. There are other countries doing much more. Mm -hmm. But this is part of who we are. These are our values. This is part of our laws, international laws, and our commitment as citizens of the world. So we need to stop talking about immigrants as the enemy and we need to start thinking about this is an asset and we need them right now it's 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 an interesting point about um accents because i i think a lot about this i've thought about this ever since i traveled abroad when i was in college and i remember meeting people who knew like three languages and somebody pointed out to me that when you so if you're a native english speaker and then you learn spanish you have an accent in Spanish. Like, your accent is not <laughs> quite correct, right? It sounds a little not right. Your grammar might be a little off. Like, when, when somebody explained to me, you know that you sound like we hear people who English is their second language or if they have a slight accent. That's what we sound like when we're speaking in another language. Also, a lot of Americans are like, speak English. I'm like, you only know one language. The person talking to you, who you perceive as maybe less smart because they have an accent, knows more than one language. They are, by like, by definition, more intelligent. <laughs> so, like, I think yeah, yeah. the whole thing is backwards. And I just, like, I've, I've been obsessed with that idea ever since I was um, young because I've, I love languages. I think it's it's an amazing thing to have a dexterity with different languages and people that know more than one are intelligent. And the fact that you have an accent, just remember when you are speaking in another language that is not English, English, you have an accent. This is how you sound to the, the native speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're feeling my you're feeling my heart certainly not and, and that is why for the hispanic federation yeah. for us and our member agencies um e english language learners for us it's important that we preserve their native language while they learn english and that we strive to make sure that as you say that we are a country that embraces individual cultures and that other languages europe and many other parts of the world embrace the idea of being bilingual, trilingual, and that is an asset. And it yes. will make us competitive in the world when we're talking about global economies. So at the, as, as part of these learning and actually realizing the, the reality of our country, we need to understand that those abilities should not be suppressed. We should not try to get these children or these individuals to just like blend in. We should encourage them that learn English, preserve their native language, and also bring some of that knowledge and world uh, culture into our communities because it really makes us stronger, it makes us richer, and it makes us competitive. And that should be a, a, a something that Republicans and conservatives are all about how the United States needs to be competitive with the world, should be taken into consideration and embrace it. Really, really, really true. So how can people um, get engaged and involved with the Hispanic Federation or even with this issue if, they, if they've been um, ignited by this conversation, which I hope they have been? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, well, for us, it's just like this is our website, uh, hispanicfederation.org. We have already... Uh, supported 3,000 individuals get kickstart the asylum cases through our Caminos de Esperanza or Roads to Hope is our program that provides direct legal representation to the most vulnerable in immigrants in this country, not only in New York, but across the country. So hispanicfederation.org. Very important and an important conversation. 
Frankie Miranda, president and CEO of the Hispanic Federation. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was great to have you on. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope to be back soon. Amazing. We're going to take a very quick break, and then we're going to be talking about abortion in the state of Alabama. A lot going on there on the ground. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 